Okay. Welcome back, uh, those of us who are, who are stuck with us. Thanks so much for sticking with us. Uh, this is around about the time of the conference when uh, everyone's thoughts naturally turn to the bar or to the airport or to the airport bar. Um, we slightly feared that the five of us or the, the six of us were going to be talking amongst ourselves. So thanks so much for coming back and, and joining in with us. Uh, we're here to discuss uh, enforcement, uh, in particular differences in competition, antitrust enforcement with regards to digital, to digital platforms across the Atlantic between Europe, uh, and, uh, uh, between Europe and America. And this is a discussion that was uh, rather elegantly framed for us this morning by our keynote speaker at breakfast, uh, at Mario Monti. Um, just to sort of oversimplify, because I'm a journalist, um, there's not a great deal of difference in antitrust policy in uh, merger control, whether horizontal or, verge, uh, or vertical, between uh, Europe and America. Uh, there's not a whole lot of difference in the way cartels are policed. Okay, you can go to jail in America, you just get a big fine for your company in, in Europe, but the way it's approached is, is, is fairly similar. The big difference in antitrust enforcement is uh, is the treatment of dominant firms. That's firms that supply the bulk of the market. Uh, monopolization cases, as they're called in America, uh, uh, abuse of uh, a dominant market position, as it's referred to in, in, in Europe. That's, the, that's where the big divergence uh, really is. Uh, we heard yesterday from uh, the uh, Assistant Attorney General of the, the DOJ, who, who cited the Microsoft case when he was giving an example about how uh, competition policy kind of adapt to a digital age. And lots of people, I think, observed that that was a case that, was, that started nearly 20 years ago. Um, by contrast, there hasn't been a whole lot of, of uh, monopolization cases uh, since then, certainly not high profile ones. By contrast, just to take the example of Google, or that is the best example, uh, Google was fined 2.4 billion euros, 2.7 billion dollars uh, last year for uh, essentially uh, uh, giving uh, more prominence to its uh, shop, uh, shopping comparison site than to, to rivals. There are two other cases uh, that the EU is pursuing at the moment against Google. One, uh, where, where the company is charged with using its uh, search monopoly to um, basically squeeze out rival app producers on the, on the uh, Andro uh, Android phones. Um, and secondly, there's a, a much longer running case uh, on advertising, again, where, where it's essentially the accusation is about freezing out potential rivals. Um, so there are, many other, there are many other sort of cases, but Google is just a great, good example of that. Um, we've also seen uh, antitrust action against uh, uh, Intel and a state aid case against Apple, but I think we're going to leave those aside f for our discussion today. Um, next month, the General Data Protection Regulation, a new... Uh, stricter set of privacy uh, laws comes into force in Europe. Um, that's not strictly a, an antitrust regulation, but it is starting to bleed into or will bleed into the way antitrust is done in Europe, as we're going to hear a, a little bit later. Um, to discuss all of these issues, well, <coughs> the panel here is really going to try and answer three questions. One is um, how exactly, in what ways does enforcement differ? Uh, across uh, in Europe compared to America. Secondly, why does it differ? What are the different philosophies? What are the different historical contexts? What, what are the different legal systems that mean, that, that, that explain this difference? And third, and I think the, the sort of more contentious bit is, is, is the EU, EU approach, which is, uh, Mario Monti said this morning, is more, not more aggressive, but more vigorous. Um, is that actually a, a better approach? Is it more effective? Um, is it, does it actually work? There's a lot of noise about how Europe is more activist, but is it actually any more effective? Um, to discuss these issues, um, we've got another very distinguished panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce everyone from outside in, if that's OK. So on my far right is uh, uh, Ariel Izraki, who's a professor of uh, competition law at Oxford University. He's also the co-author of Virtual Competition, the sort of the very dystopian view of the digital e economy, which is, itself is a, a transatlantic joint venture with Maurice Stuckey, who you saw from the previous panel. Uh, to my immediate right is uh, Hustus Haukap, who is the director of the Dusseldorf Institute for Competition and a former chair of the German Monopolies Commission. To my far left, uh, Thomas Vigne, chairman uh, of the Global Antitrust Group at Clifford Chance, the big law firm. 
He practices mainly before the European Commission, the European Courts, and give us a very uh, active uh, European perspective. Next to him uh, is Gary Reback, who was aptly characterized, he's a Silicon Valley antitrust lawyer, who was aptly characterized uh, at a panel, on a panel yesterday as a champion of the small guy squashed by the, the bigger firms, notably in the Microsoft case in the 1990s, but also more or less ever since. You may uh, remember him also from a, this morning's session. And finally, and by, by no means least, uh, Bill Kafarsik, who is, uh, who is uh, uh, the director of the Competition Law Center at the George Washington University, also a former chair of the, the FTC, one of the many positions he held at the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission. He is also, very much for the purposes of this panel, he's on the board of the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK, the main U UK uh, antitrust authority, and also teaches at King's College in London, so he has very much a sort of transatlantic uh, perspective to give, to give to us. I want to start with um, Ariel uh, uh, and ask him to give us an, an, outlaw, an outline of, of uh, the legal differences, uh, the, yeah, the differences in law between the, the EU and America. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and I very much enjoyed the discussion that we had yesterday and today. And something that was quite interesting was that we heard from some skeptics when it comes to the US that told us that if only the law was different, then there would be something to do using antitrust. But unfortunately, the law was different, uh, very narrow, um, obviously because it became narrow by uh, some sort of a process of interpretation. And in that respect, I'm really glad to be the one that brings you hope and talk about the European Union, where the law <laughs> is wide and there would not be any problem for anyone uh, to consider, at least in theory, the possibility of applying competition law to new developments. It doesn't mean that we should or that we do, but in terms of the law, there is a massive difference. And that brings us to, I think, the starting point, which is although we all speak about competition law and antitrust, and we use the same rhetoric, and we actually also speak the same language when it comes to economic analysis, the reality is that this is embedded in something which is a political structure, in something which is a law that reflects the domestic reality in each and every one of the jurisdictions. And in many jurisdictions, it includes more than just the pure economics. So if we take at a level of simplification that in the US, antitrust has reduced itself to something which align quite uh, neatly uh, with an economic vision, then you could argue that in the EU, EU, this is not entirely the case. It doesn't mean that the EU operates in a way that is detached from economics, not at all. In fact, economic analysis is serving to understand and try and limit the application of European competition law in order to ensure optimal application. But when you look at the source of competition law, what you see is that we have a treaty which has been renewed uh, roughly six years ago. So, First of all, we are very different in the sense that we're not talking about a source of legislation which is relatively ancient, but we're talking about, we spoke a little bit about the democratic will. We are talking about something which is relatively recent, in which competition law is used as one of many tools to advance the goals of the European community, the European Union, and one of those goals is to promote the welfare and well-being of the people of the European Union. And it is with this, within this context that our discussion takes place. And I think two things I assume we will discuss here. One will be the intervention impulse of the European Commission or competition agencies across Europe. And it's important to understand that we have a heterogeneous uh, system. We have the commission that deals with at the federal level, but we also have member states and some of them are very much interventionist in comparison to others. Some will take a more formalistic approach, others will not. So that will be one level. And the second one is what is the scope of competition? And very minor comments on the scope um, of competition. In Europe, we have a multitude of goals. At the top, I think we would all agree more or less that we have consumer welfare. Or at the center, at the core, we have consumer well-being. So the term well-being is wider than welfare, and that raises some problems, no doubt. But other values that you have and will find their, ways, their way into case law and are mentioned in legislation include fairness, of course, efficiency, effective competitive structure, 
uh, market integration, of course, which is part of the goals of the European Union, but also plurality and economic freedom. Now, that multitude of goals creates some significant challenges because what it does, it calls for some balancing. A balancing between an approach that tries to literally only identify what is harmful to competition and an approach that tries to protect to some extent other values. And what you have is a balancing exercise that takes place almost in every case. Fairness is viewed through a, through a prism of efficiency, not as a standalone idea. Efficiency is viewed from a consumer perspective uh, approach. So everything is entwined in a way that makes it obviously a more complex environment, but an environment that has been relatively consistent. In our discussion, that environment is important because it does give you, at least at the origin, more capabilities to deal with some of the effects that we discussed. It gives you a better ability to think, for instance, <coughs> or on possible effects that could impact on consumers or producers or transfer of wealth. Your desirability to pursue that is a different question. Now, last comment possibly, we also have, of course, a different design in Europe, and that has clear significance. Competition law tends many times to fill in gaps when you see some, something happening. And I think it's very important when we discuss competition in Europe also to appreciate that if you compare the regulatory regime around competition in different jurisdictions, you will see that some jurisdictions are just able to deal with some problems using different tools. Others have decided to deal with those issues using competition. And that inevitably results in a different scope um, uh, for competition. So I think uh, I would probably end with, with those comments, but just already put some sort of a defensive comment uh, in the air. Sometimes you hear European competition law is about protecting the competitors. It's about, it's, uh, I think all these uh, populistic arguments uh, really have no grounding. The decisions or, or the aim of most of the enforcers in Europe is to do the right thing. The aim is to try and be as much as possible in line with economic analysis. But I think the difference is that the economic analysis does not override the normative values that competition law is trying to advance in Europe. And agencies and enforcers are very aware of, of those normative values. And those do change the scope of competition. Not necessarily the level of enforcement, although many here would argue that Europe is much more interventionist, but it doesn't mean that you just pursue anything. It doesn't mean that you pursue anyone that argued that something is unfair, not at all. What it means is that your scope is wider. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Ariel. I, I wanna try and jump between continents just to keep this, uh, um, to be, so be totally fair, like a brilliant antitrust uh, authority. Um, can I, Ask Gary to take up. We, we've heard from Ariel saying uh, the legal framework is different, even the, the values and the scope is, is somewhat different. Can you tell us how that drills down into how um, the authorities look at the look at the firms themselves, dominant firms in particular? Yeah. So let me. Uh, I'm going to speed through that and then try to apply it to some of the things that other people said earlier today. So. Uh, one important difference in the two jurisdictions or the two regimes would appear to be single firm conduct. In other words, what can a big company do? And in Europe, they have such a clear, easy way of, of explaining this. Uh, what's a dominant company? A dominant company is a company that can make its business decisions without cons uh, considering what competitors would do. Easy to say, pretty easy to understand. In the US, what does it mean to have market power? Well, you have to be able to raise price while excluding competitors. What does that mean? What if I raise price in a related market or the second side of a two-sided market? Um, what if I don't raise price at all? Is monopoly power the same as market power? So we're left with a confusing situation. And similarly, in terms of the conduct, uh, in Europe, the, a dominant firm has a special obligation to protect competition and, and generally has to do to treat competitors the same way it treats its own subs or assets and so forth and so on. Pretty easy to understand and suggest its own remedy. In the United States, what conduct is illegal? 
well, you know, I could put Dennis Carlton on one side of the room and Carl Shapiro on the other, and they could debate that for about two or three days. Um, they would. And, and it's because, <laughs> frankly, we, we, we have made this problem for ourselves. We have something called the rule of reason, which says net, net, what's the effect? But then we put on top of that some libertarian layer from the Trinco case. I don't have to sell to somebody I don't want to. And then we start asking about, well, is this a product improvement or not? Maybe that changes the standard. And then we have to show a direct effect on competitors, which, of course, in Europe, they kind of assume that if you wipe out the competition, maybe it's going to hurt competitors. And so Europe would appear to have a really clean, straightforward way of dealing with these problems. And we seem to have tied ourselves in knots. Uh, but if you look at the results, I'm not quite sure that that's the way it's actually played out. I mean, the notion of treating competitors the same way you treat your own assets suggests a remedy. If you're not doing that, stop. Treat everybody fairly. And that was the remedy that the EU imposed on Google in the search manipulation case. The problem is they imposed that remedy 10 years after Google first started the conduct and after they'd wiped out all the competition. And so Google could come back and say, okay, now I'm treating everybody fairly. And they were, it's just that most of their competitors were damaged or out of business or something else. So the net result so far in that case has been a two point whatever billion dollar, $2.7 billion fine on Google. And I keep going around asking, what did Margaret Vestiger do with that money? I mean, did she bail out Greek banks? Did she subsidize French dairy farmers? Maybe she just had a big party and none of us were invited, but that, that none of that has fixed the problem. Namely, there is no competition in the sector that Google wiped out. The remedy didn't restore competition and so forth. Okay, what can I say about our flawed system? Well, in the past, you know, we have a long history longer than Europe, and, and it has worked pretty well. And I take a strong opposition to statements made earlier today about how you can't break up a company. I heard all that from my antitrust professor, Bill Baxter, before he went to Washington as part of the Reagan administration and broke up AT&T. And uh, it, was, it was all the same whining. What will happen? You'll pick up the, uh, the phone. You won't hear a dial tone. Our troops won't be able to communicate with headquarters in the field. Dogs will live with cats, as Bill Murray once said. It will be terrible. None of that happened. And I might point out at the same time, Baxter, who was a, a conservative Republican, was doing this. The Democrats were wringing their hands. Stephen Breyer published his first book on regulation where he was saying, oh my, we can't do anything, same hand wringing, there'll be something terrible and so forth and so on. Uh, but there wasn't and it worked out fine and you may logically argue it produced the internet when all these other long lines people came in. And I, in, I published a book in 2009, I went through several examples like that. I don't wanna take the time uh, to go back through them today. Um, I think the notion that we heard from Professor Troll earlier is, is really a pervasive problem now in antitrust where he says, I can't break up f Google or Facebook, what am I going to do with the ads? Well, you know, I think that problem can be solved and asking me to solve it before I've done any investigation whatsoever is kind of a way to make sure I don't ever do an investigation now, isn't it? You know, I know that problem can be solved because we solved all those problems of AT&T that were so much worse. And so maybe we'd spin off the ads entirely. Maybe we'd create two databases and have two ad companies. Who knows? If we got a great team of economists in a room, I'm sure they could figure something out. Okay, one other quick example that came up from, from today, the success of American antitrust enforcement in the Microsoft case. Too many people think of antitrust enforcement as whatever the judge imposes. In that case, the trial was the principal remedy. Why was that? It wasn't because, as you just saw in the last month, a very smart CEO was sitting there with a bunch of politicians who knew nothing, and couldn't ask him a hard question. In that case, the CEO was confronted by a top <coughs> trial lawyer who had discovery of all the data and emails of that company before the cross-examination. You think the CEO wanted to go through that again? Not likely. The trial is frequently the remedy.
Microsoft, if you think back 12 or 14 years, after it ran Netscape out of business, there was no smartphone market. The only way to get to Google was to go to the Microsoft browser and type www.google.com. But if you did that, there's no technical reason why they had to send you to Google. They could have put up a big red warning sign that says, this is an evil site. It takes your personal information without telling you. It does all these other kinds of things. Don't click through to here. And indeed, Microsoft has such a, a warning label. And I have a mock-up screen that I've taken around to state attorney generals and others to show them what Microsoft could have done but didn't. That would have killed Google in the cradle. Why didn't Microsoft do it? They told me they didn't do it because of antitrust. I've been telling people that for a long time. A month ago, a New York Times reporter actually followed up and went to Microsoft former employees, including those charged with enforcing the decree, and they said, yes, that's right. That's right. We were tired of cutting billion-dollar checks one after the other. We were tired of having lawyers sit our, over our shoulder. We weren't going to go through a trial again. Better to let Google live, and that brought us Google, Facebook, and everybody else. Okay, there's, uh, I'm, w I'm worried that we might not have enough things to discuss in the discussion part of the, uh, <laughs> of the, of the, of the uh, panel. Um, can I take up one, uh, one of the many points that, that Gary uh, made there uh, about um, uh, the sort of special obligation that, uh, that is on European, in Europe on, uh, on dominant firms? And turn to uh, Justus. And uh, Ariel at the beginning was also was telling us a little bit about um, uh, if you think you just have to worry about the, the federal authority, the, the European Commission, you also have to worry about the member states. Can you tell us a little bit, Justus, about um, how uh, the uh, GDPR is uh, bleeding into antitrust enforcement in Germany, a little bit of the background on that, and how that affects uh, Facebook? Well, I need to be a bit speculative about this um, because uh, I'm not a lawyer, but an economist uh, and uh, the Facebook. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, that's uh, probably one of the, I think, more fascinating cases uh, currently running in Germany where the German Antitrust Authority, the Bundeskartellamt, the Federal Cartel Authority, um, is investigating whether Facebook is um, abusing its market power um, in an exploitative way. Uh, so that's one difference, uh, actually, that we have. There's uh, exploitative abuse and obstructive abuse. Uh, uh, in, in Europe, and exploitative abuse basically means you are not allowed to charge high prices in most of the cases. So the typical case will be against uh, gas or water companies or companies like this where you can somehow compare prices and costs or uh, have a number of companies and can compare them somehow and uh, those who charge way too much uh, are forced to lower their price uh, uh, in the end. So it's a substitute for regulation uh, to some degree. Uh, and now we have one of the first cases, I think, where it's a non-price related issue and the, this, it's not quite clear. The, the Federal Cartel Office is not, um, hasn't made a lot of releases yet and sort of whenever you hear Andreas Mund speaking, um, <laughs> the story is, it takes a slightly different turn, uh, uh, let's say. Um, so um, um, the story appears to be, uh, let's say, um, that um, the Federal Cartel Office is charging Facebook in, first of all, combining too much data um, of people and also maybe for asking too much uh, uh, data of the people. B the idea being people are paying uh, with data. And then, of course, you can discuss whether that's a good idea or not idea, whether um, given that we know all about the privacy paradox that uh, there are so many people who don't even care about the data and especially the people who are on Facebook may want to share their data. Uh, or some of them at least all the time. It's a question whether they can be exploited uh, somehow, whether their privacy sort of is infringed on too much somehow. And here the new um, data protection guidelines may come in uh, because one of the ideas appears to be that dominant firms have um, obligation to go beyond legal standards uh, that are provided in the uh, data protection guidelines. And of course then we know from sort of our old theory of exploitative abuse that that may be it may be a dangerous sort of uh, uh, undertaking uh, if you oblige um, dominant firms to provide products that are either cheaper or better than better in the sense that they provide more privacy uh, than competing uh, firms because that would ultimately mean that of course consumers can rely on whenever I go to the dominant firm I get the best privacy uh, standard. Uh, so it's not 
entirely sure that this will help competition at the very end. Uh, it may help consumers that are on Facebook, and if we are completely sure that there will be, not, will be never ever any competition uh, to Facebook, we can be very happy about mm. this. Uh, if, if we think there may be competition, uh, of course now consumers will be sent the message, go to Facebook, they will, be, they will have the best privacy standards by law. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting question whether it's a good approach or not. If you think about sort of infor injecting competition into the market, um, it may be not so good. If you are reasonably certain that it's a natural monopoly, um, it may be a good idea. Um, but that's a question that's, that's open for debate. Can I add one more point? Of course, yeah. uh, maybe. Um, because I think there's not only the difference in exploitative abuse and obstructive abuse, and the special focus on exploitative abuse in, in some of the European countries. I think um, one key difference between the US and EU enforcement is not only the philosophy, uh, but also the treatment of vertical restraints. Uh, actually, vertical restraints are, are treated much more leniently in the US, and um, actually, especially in some of the member states, for example, in Germany, um, the Bundeskartellamt has been very active in classifying all sorts of practices as a vertical uh, restraints. For example, the uh, cross parity uh, platform parity agreements that uh, Jean Tirol talked about earlier today are by and large forbidden, uh, uh, per se. Well, it's, it's, it's close to being a, a per se uh, uh, prohibition. Maybe not exactly, but uh, even quite small companies are not sort of, uh, have difficulties in engaging in this type of practice, <coughs> even small hotel. Uh, booking platforms. Uh, and also there's sort of these dual pricing schemes that exist uh, that many manufacturers, for example, want to give rebates particularly to offline, to brick and mortar stores, which uh, the Federal Cartel Office has by and large prohibited. On a, it's, it's seen like a core, um, it's, it's seen like a vertical restraint for some, uh, so this price discrimination, this input price discrimination is basically uh, prohibited, which means, funnily enough, I think that while Mario Monti was praising the consistency of the European Commission's approach, I think he's right over time it is consistent, yeah, but it's not quite clear whether sort of it's, it's consistent over fields, uh, let's say, of, uh, of antitrust merger and cartel um, uh, uh, policy. And because here we have the funny effect that when you basically, manufacturers are not allowed to give special rebates to brick and mortar stores, basically that means you actually give another advantage to online, store, to online retailers, Amazon, for example, and even fostering concentration, possibly, uh, of the retail business. Um, so I'm not quite sure how consistent the policy always is um, to be. No. Well, the grass is maybe always green on the other side. So um, being in Europe, one maybe has a more critical look at European issues as well. Well, it sounds like it goes to the issue of, of how effective some of the... So there's a lot mm. of intervention, but is, that actually, is it actually fostering more competition or is it actually making it easier for um, incumbents to sort of solidify their position. I want to, if I, just going to break my own rule already and, and bring in Thomas Vigneault on this, um, and whether what we're seeing in, in Germany uh, in relation to, to, to data privacy um, is going to be a sort of leading indicator of what we see in the rest of Europe, and whether indeed data privacy is actually becoming an antitrust issue, and whether that's a good thing or not. Yeah. Um well, a couple, three years ago, I think there would have been near unanimity among European antitrust enforcers that data protection is data protection and antitrust is antitrust and never the twain shall meet. That clearly has changed a great deal. The, the Bundeskartellamt's Facebook case is the most concrete example of that. Um, and it's quite possible that it might remain the only example of it in the sense that Germany, for rather natural historical reasons, is particularly sensitive to privacy considerations. Uh, and German data protection is particularly, law is particularly powerful, and, it, and it's a very intensely political issue. Um, and secondly, there is case law from the German um, Constitutional Court, which provides the basis for the Bundeskartellamt's Facebook case. Um, which doesn't really exist in other member states. So, um, I guess I would have two quick answers to that. Um, one would be that there clearly is a trend in Europe towards seeking to address data protection-like issues via antitrust, but the German federal um, cartel office's case 
against Facebook might expand to other countries, and it might not. Lawyer's answer. I do have a few other points about Time that. will tell. Yes, <laughs> a lawyer's answer. <laughs> I have some points about why things are different between Europe and the United States, but we could come back to that as you wish. Okay. Um, Bill, you get to, uh, to, to go last, um, uh, so you have the benefit of hearing what everyone said, but I want you to, to first um, bring us back, in, in a sense, close, close what um, Ariel started at the beginning. Um, we've had a lot in the last two days about how uh, the Chicago school uh, capture of antitrust policy in the, in the 80s, and then that's fed through to, to jurisprudence subsequently, has sort of tied the hands of the agencies in the US, and that's why you haven't seen a lot of Section 2 or other sort of mobilization cases. Um, to what extent is that, does that explain the transatlantic difference, or are there other things going on? No, oh, thanks, John, and uh, thanks to the organizers for giving us the platform, and I just mentioned that I speak for myself and not the uh, Competition and Markets Authority. Uh, I, I think there's a, uh, a more nuanced diagnosis that's important. Uh, I don't think uh, in the entire proceeding so far you've heard the names Philip Arita or Donald Turner, <coughs> although just from Gary you heard Steve Breyer. Uh, <laughs> And you've also heard the suggestion that the world turned in 1981, 1982, that that's when things changed. Uh, from 1945 until the mid-70s, US policy dealing with individual dominant firms and concentrated sectors was far more aggressive than one has ever seen before or at any time now. If you think that the EU approach in dealing with Google, for example, is active or even aggressive, um, you have no idea of what the US was seeking to do in the post-war period up through the early 70s. It changed. Why did it change? Certainly the perspectives of well-known Chicago school commentators. But I'm going to suggest to you that equally important was the modern Harvard school of Arita Turner and Breyer. Uh, you start in 1975 with the publication of the Arita and Turner paper on predatory pricing. It's one of the most important antitrust law review articles ever published. And what do you see in that article? You see the price below cost test. You see the beginnings of recoupment. But what you see more generally is an emphatic plea for a risk-averse approach to enforcement in this area, with the view being if you make mistakes, you're telling firms to raise their prices, and competition law should always be on the side of lower prices. 1978, two crucial books published, classics. The Antitrust Paradox by Robert Bork, and we've heard his name several times in these proceedings. But equally important, Arita and Turner published the first volume of their treatise called Antitrust Law. Not only do they converge with Bork on goals, that is, they talk about goals, and they say, what about the diverse, pluralistic, egalitarian vision in the Sherman Act, in the Clayton Act, and the seller kefauver Act? The answer that Arita and Turner give is, who cares? Because in the word of Philip Arita, it's not administrable. That gets planted into a great deal of commentary over time. It's a real pivot. But the other focus of the 78 volume was the real menace in the US system is private rights of action, the way they're designed here. Mandatory trouble damages, contingent fees, joint and several liability, asymmetric fee shifting, class actions. Arita and Turner said these should be treated with the same severity and caution as criminal punishments and, and incarceration. Their policy proposal was, because these are so dangerous, competition law should make adjustments to account for it. You can't change the private rights formula. But what they said is, you can change the evidentiary standards and you can change the substantive liability tests because those are dedicated to the courts and the common law framework through which the elaboration of the broad standards in the statutes would be adopted. So they push again and again in their writings, it's absorbed into the jurisprudence, that courts should change the substantive standards to overcome the tendency of private rights to overdeter. What has that given us? It's given us a jurisprudence 
that is exceedingly cautious and worried about <coughs> private rights with a change in liability standards and the landmarks we're familiar with, Brook Group, Trinco, those are Harvard Chicago joint ventures. Yes, Scalia writes the majority opinion in Trinco, but but Breyer's along for the ride, and he channels Arita and Turner at every turn. Brook Group, it's an absorption of the original Arita and Turner prescription in 1975, and it's all geared to this concern about private rights of action. The last time the US federal agencies were in front of the Supreme Court in a Section 2 case, not as a friend of the court, but in their own case was Otter Tail in 1973, that's 45 years ago. That means that all of the Supreme Court jurisprudence dealing with Section 2 of the Sherman Act has been set in the context of private cases where the court again and again refers to its perceived menace of US trouble damage actions. I'm not suggesting to you for a second that the court's perceptions are correct. I am emphatic in saying the court believes it. And what it means is that US standards have been bumped upward to account for this concern, and those standards have ensnared the federal government as well. To put it another way, if it were not for this Harvard School-inspired concern with private trouble damage actions as a means of enforcement, I'd suggest to you that US monopolization doctrine would look a lot more like abusive dominance doctrine in the European Union. In a sense, we are stuck in a jurisprudence that is responsive to this concern. Again, not the product of Chicago. This comes from Harvard. And if you don't change that underlying concern by changing the debate in the courts, changing the understanding of what private rights do, you have to think about developing a mechanism that gives the government separation from the overhang of this doctrine that's desi designed to deal with private rights of action. And the Europeans don't have this. They're developing private rights. The question is, where does it go? A warning label to them is, watch out for how it spills over into the public enforcement mechanism. But this is a fundamental difference in the US regime. If you don't address it head on, you won't change the results in the courts. OK, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, debate about that, seeing as the, the, the Chicago school's been in the dock for most of the last two days. And right at the last minute, we're <laughs> blame shifting to, to another of the major universities. Um, so I'm sure there's lots of people in the audience who want to come in on that. I want to, I want to just um, maybe use that as a starting point and say, OK, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to just assert that, that, let's say, Bill's right on this. On this. Yes. And he says, if, if it wasn't for the private rights of action, uh, the two doctrines would look rather similar in, in Europe and, and America. What I'd like to ask the, the panel more generally, and, and, and maybe the audience to think about this as well, is, 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 is kind of so what? Is there is a more vigorous, aggressive, interventionist approach in Europe, but what has it really achieved? I mean, Gary touched on this a little bit in, in his opening remarks about saying, well, a 2.4 billion euro fine on a, or 2.7 billion euro, uh, dollar fine on a, you know, an 80 billion revenue uh, monster is just like firing, dart, firing darts at an elephant, so who really cares about that? Uh, you see similar sort of comments about that in, in, in sort of cartel enforcement as well. Big fines, what do they do? Send people to jail, that really, really is a deterrence. Um, so I just want to ask the, the rest of the panel, um, okay, Europe has a different approach, and maybe uh, if, if the US looked a bit more like Europe, would it actually be, would we be any more effective in policing dominant firms than we are at the moment? Ariel, you want to come in? Yes, and, and I'll, I'll take that opportunity that just to, to make a few very short comments on, on what sure. was, was heard before. Um, I think number two tries harder. You know, that's a famous ad uh, from a car rental company. And, and, and the EU had the advantage of not leading the field and actually coming relatively late. And that is reflected <coughs> in the legislation. It's also reflected in, in the fact that the EU model is the leading model around the world. The majority of jurisdictions adopt the EU language around the world, and there is a reason for that. It is simpler, it is easier, and it actually says what it does. So um, it is easier to follow if you compare it to the Sherman Act, for example, where you have a whole body of case law that actually tells you what it, what it is. And, and I agree with Bill to the extent that antitrust in the US, at least from an EU perspective, has been constantly pushed towards irrelevancy. 
uh, in the sense that, not, not of course when it comes to, to collusion, but when it comes to, to market power, I think companies here, when we spoke yesterday about certainty, they certainly benefit from certainty. The certainty that it is highly unlikely that anyone from here is going to take an effective action against them. Is the EU more effective? I would say yes. Is it perfect? From, far from it. What are the counterfactuals? The counterfactuals are no one does anything, or at least you're trying to do something. So in that reality, even if you have the Google, the Google case is super unique because you started through a path of Article 9, which is a commitment. Sorry, which, which Google case? The, the shopping, shopping case. The shopping, shopping case. case. So it, it is extremely long uh, and was stretched over many years because of the way um, it developed. Um, but certainly, one of the criticisms that we hear about antitrust is that antitrust may be slow to react. But you have to look at antitrust, and that's true to the US and the EU and other jurisdictions in context. You have to consider the benefits of a flexible tool. Um, and compare them to the risks and costs of rigid regulation, especially when we deal with dynamic markets as the markets that we are addressing here. Antitrust might be the only or the best way we have to deal with certain, uh, with certain practices. So overall, I would say the EU is effective. In the EU, you have uh, very different approaches. And I would mention that in a year or so, we might see some diversion that is increasing in Europe. If Brexit indeed goes ahead and the CMA is detached from the rest of Europe, the voice of the CMA, which is very central in balancing the views within Europe as far as competition agencies are concerned, will no longer be relevant. And what you might see is a slide in Europe towards something which might be uh, slightly more interventionist. Um, and then you might have a quicker uh, resolution of certain things. I'm not saying that that might be good or bad, because one of the risks that, of course, you have is that if you over-intervene, you might shield competition. So there is always this very careful balancing. Uh, it's far from being perfect, but from a European perspective, if I compare the US to the EU, um, I have no doubt. Can I also add yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, let me also add two things, maybe. Uh, one on the, on the private rights that, uh, Bill, you were uh, uh, focusing on, I think. Um, that, that's, that is correct to some degree, but in the US, as um, uh, uh, Mr. Monti explained this morning, we have these electoral cycles, uh, basically. So I always thought that this private enforcement provides some degree of stability to antitrust enforcement, at least. So this was an institutional complement, more or less, to the uh, public enforcement. Uh, in Europe, we don't need really this. We wouldn't need this private enforcement to some degree because we have a very steady and stable public enforcement. Still, we now get the private enforcement because I think people don't think about these institutional complementarities uh, so much. So we import the US style private enforcement to some degree. And so maybe we see some convergence that anti public enforcement will be more reluctant to enforce, actually, because they know there will be the private enforcement following, <laughs> which makes it more risky somehow, given that there are the first cases also where, uh, or the first case being brought against antitrust authorities claiming for damages because they had over or wrong uh, type of enforcement. Let me also briefly say some, maybe if I, if I, if I may, on the, um, on the effectiveness. I think the Google Shopping case, as you said, is unique, and we will see how it comes, will end up in the courts uh, in the end. But what we see here is, a, to some degree, a shift in competition policy with respect to market definition, uh, really, because now the European Commission has taken, let's say, much more liberty in defining uh, markets, uh, irrespective of uh, studying actual consumer behavior. Uh, so it's... it's, uh, it's Somebody else said before, a more normative approach uh, to market uh, definition or not so much a positive approach where you really study substitutability. So it's, it's more a shaping of markets uh, somehow than uh, safeguarding competition. And this is or like, or substitution patterns uh, uh, or substitution possibilities. Uh, so this is an think, interesting twist now. It will, well, we don't know how it will end up in the courts. Uh, in the end, it will certainly go to probably two courts. Um, and uh, uh, after that, we will maybe know, we may know whether it's more effective or not. So just, just so I understand, you're saying that, that okay, the 2.4 billion fine is neither here nor there. What we have here is a precedent that uh, gives a certain amount of discretion in getting away from yeah. rigid definitions of market, of rigid market definitions. So you can say that there is a market for search and and and. 
so this gives us this gives more discretion going forward to antitrust authorities. That's the that's this a significant thing. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, did you want to yeah, come in? I, I might yeah. make a few comments on, sure. on a few of those things. First of all, with respect to um, whether Europe will evolve in the direction of U.S. Um, private actions and whether that will have the same disciplinary effect upon the interpretation of dominance law in Europe. I tend to doubt it. I'd be very interested in Bill's perspective on this because even if there is um, more private actions with respect to dominance, today there is virtually nothing, um, really close to nothing. Um, even if that evolves, the um, the other elements that I think are really quite critical in the United States are unlikely to. Contingency fees are not going to evolve in the same ways. Class, class actions are unlikely to all yeah. evolve in the same ways. Treble damages won't exist. So those sorts of things I think are an important part of the, the package. Um, then secondly, with respect to effectiveness, this is something which is um, yeah, sort of close to my heart in a sense, having been deeply involved in the Microsoft case for quite some years and now deeply involved in the various Google cases for some time. Um, I would agree with, with Gary in a sense, although in Europe it's different, that the trial is the remedy. Um, in the Microsoft case, you know, there were two cases. There was the, in, there, there was the big case with interoperability uh, and with the tying of media player to Windows. And there, as we told the commission at the time, the the um, untying remedy with respect to Windows Media Player was at best described as a joke. Um, about 750 copies of Windows N without Media Player were sold throughout Europe. Um, a joke is too nice a word to 700 use about. of those at the commission. Yeah, and one, of, <laughs> one of them to me. <laughs> so as a museum piece. Um, so that was a ridiculous remedy. On the other hand, the interoperability remedy which took much too long to arrive at, was actually used by competitors. It wasn't fantastic, it wasn't perfect, but it was actually used. And then there was the, the case um, which I filed on behalf of, of Opera, a small Norwegian browser company, with, with respect to the, the bundling of Internet Explorer with Windows, and that was resolved via, via a commitment. And that commitment actually worked. Um, and the commitment was, um, originally it was come up with by the chief scientist at Opera who's Norwegian and thinks of things in terms of democracy, so he called it a ballot <laughs> screen. The commission changed that to a choice screen so that if you, if you buy a new Windows, this is expired now, but for five years you bought a new Windows computer and when you booted it up first you were given a choice of, of five browsers rotating and you, you chose. Um, and as demonstrated by some, inf some, um, some work that Mozilla did, um, and I think Harvey Anderson, the gen then general counsel, did a, did a blog, if I remember correctly, it was Harvey, and, and it showed that when Microsoft made the mistake, and it really was a mistake of, of programming Windows in a sense that turned off the choice screen, so for like a year it was turned off, um, and nobody seemed to have noticed. Um, but during that period of time, the, the Mozilla data indicates that there really was a difference with respect to the take up of browsers. So that the, the bundling, when it was, when it was not, um, when it was just pure bundling and wasn't affected by this choice screen, there was a significant difference. So I, I don't think we should say these remedies are useless always. Um, I, would, uh, I would certainly say that the shopping remedy at the moment is useless. I think the Commission is likely to pursue remedies proceedings against Google. We shall see. Um, but in any event, it's obviously come far, far too late. The Android case, um, the, the, the complaint which got it going, I filed against Google, so it's also rather close to my heart, has come, is coming much too late, so I, I fear that it might not be particularly effective. But, um, but we shouldn't say all hope is lost, and in particular, I'd come back to Gary's point that, uh, and some would suggest this is illegitimate, I'm not so sure that's true, but that merely the fact that, that these cases are, are pursued, um, and the reputational issues associated with them, um, and the, the cultural influence they have on the de defendants should not be underestimated. I think Microsoft became a changed company, for the better, in my view, by virtue of the, the cases that were pursued against it. That hasn't happened yet with respect to Google. Okay, I want to I bring a, a Bill in again right at the end, but, but Gary, just on this issue of, of privacy, I think you were sort of sceptical that, that um, it's going to become a, a sort of, ish, a, a sort of it's going to bleed into um, antitrust policy at the European level. In fact, you've got a, 
uh, a sort of um, you've got some evidence that, that it, it, quite the opposite from a case that you've involved well, in. Well, uh, I, can I just make a quick comment sure. on the earlier discussion? I'd just like to point out that that first predatory pricing article, the one that was, I was a clerk at the time, it came out, I had a predatory you pricing. You did it. Yeah. <laughs> I had a predatory pricing case. That's not my point. My point is that research was paid for by IBM. You know, Gary, I've looked at that. Philarita's papers, uh, tantalizingly, uh, are available at Harvard Law School. He did a lot of consulting. All of his papers related to individual matters are not available for about another 20 years. So someday we'll be able to test that. I don't think we can test that now. Okay. Bill Baxter told me, so that's what I'm basing it on. <laughs> of course, uh, Bill, Bill said a lot of things in his lifetime. He, he did. Most of them have come to pass. But, but, but in yeah, any I, event... I, I mean, that's a, it's, an alluring, it's an alluring hypothesis. There will be an answer to that at some point, unless Phil yeah. culled through all of his files, but we're going to have to wait a while. But uh, intrigued I have been by that rumor uh, with a couple of others, we went digging through the files, and you see, you see letters. Phil gave talks at Cravath every year. He gave talks at Cravath. Cravath represented IBM. But the folder that says more, that's not available for another 15 years. OK, well, we'll wait. Yeah. Um, so to answer, I, I don't, um, uh, the obvious relevance yep. of that, it's, it's wonderful to have somebody to talk to about this who's actually yep. well informed, but we talked a lot today about paid for academic research. If it turns out that was paid for academic research, it might be the most influential paid for academic research in the history of uh, antitrust jurisprudence. By far. Yeah. So. Uh, a, a marginal, a, a, an average variable cost test for a company with high fixed costs and lower marginal costs. Terrific. Yeah. Uh, and uh, recoupment. Yeah, and recoupment, most of all. Um, yeah. So on, uh, on the privacy, I wasn't disagreeing. I think, I think uh, Thomas's point was that we may have seen the, the, the high watermark in a German case of the combination of privacy and, uh, issues and antitrust issues. I, I was going to say I haven't seen that out of Vestager, uh, is my no, point. you're right. And, you know, a, a couple of years ago I filed a complaint in the Android case on behalf of a client called Disconnect that makes an app that you install on your phone and it will let you block people from tracking you. It makes visible who's tracking you, which will horrify you, and it lets you block all that stuff. And Google, of course, kicked it out of the Google Play Store which a dominant company, dominant place Storky, I would have thought that was an antitrust offense, but knowing, anticipating that they would be reluctant, uh, I, I cashed all my chits with the European Data Protection Supervisor and had him go talk to Vestager about including privacy in the Android case, and the answer was no. So it's, n it's not to say privacy is not important. Of course it is, and they'll do a lot of important things yeah. about privacy. I just don't see it at, at the commission level as right. an antitrust thing. Maybe just a quick comment on that. One, one thing is uh, I, I was generally aware of that and am saddened by that, frankly. But um, others, including myself, have sought to, brought other things in, to bring other things into the Android case, things which are sort of more centrally antitrust related, like other al uh, aspects of tying. And basically, the commissioner said, we got this case. We're, we've got enough to do. We're not going to expand it to anything. So I think the fact that they didn't expand it to something covering privacy I wouldn't necessarily take that that seriously because they wouldn't expand it to cover anything uh, else either. You're, you're right on that fact, but they told me it was privacy uh, specific. Yeah. They, they told me. OK. okay. It, what's, it, what's enormously paradoxical is what you talked about in your earlier comments, which is the Android case, they have so limited it to a bunch of exclusionary contracts, which the press has now picked up on. Google doesn't need them anymore. Mm. I mean, the thing about predatory conduct in these kinds of markets is if you do it at the right time, you can do it for a very short period of time, cripple the opposition, and then just stop. You know, you've robbed the bank. You have all the money. You can then put it into legitimate businesses. Maybe I could just say one Please. quick thing on that to follow up, and then I'll shut up. I believe, I don't know, but I believe Google knew that the conduct it was undertaking that is at issue in the Android case was illegal. Agreed. At least under 
um, European law when it undertook it. And it did it nonetheless because it figured by the time the Commission got around to deal, doing anything about it, it would have achieved exactly. that which it wished to achieve and the various positions would be entrenched. And that's exactly what's happened. Yeah, totally agree. Right, so I mean, it does rather speak to the ineffectiveness of the European Union in one regard, which is, or just the <coughs> antitrust generally. Um, Bill, I, I want to bring the audience in for, for some questions. Well, I want to give uh, Bill a chance to just uh, respond to what he's heard so far. Uh, on, on, on privacy, as Eustace has mentioned, the publicly available accounts of what's motivating the Bundeskartell Amt case are, are, are obscure. Uh, uh, I think both of us have heard Andreas give within the constraints that he must work with, uh, different accounts, and it's evolved over time. But, uh, but there is one an editorial that was published. Yes, there was, in a, in a journal that, uh, on antitrust enforcement. Why you're, Can you educate uh, us if you don't know all this inside baseball? This isn't baseball at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we co-edit the Journal of Antitrust Enforcement, and there is a, a short Editorial from Andres Mund, yeah. if anyone is interested. Yeah. And it says, I mean, you have to look into it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but, the, but he said at this point, uh, he's given a, a limited amount of information. But one explanation that I've heard on this is that the matter of concern is that Facebook executed a unilateral change in existing privacy terms. That is, it told users we'll do X, and then it changed to a regime that was X minus. Now, Again, that's one hypothesis. <coughs> if that's what happened, one wonders, where's the German Data Protection Authority? When I was at the FTC, I listened to interminable, tedious lectures from the German data protection officials about how robust the German regime was, how weak the US regime was. So far as I can tell here, they're missing in action. Uh, that is, they haven't shown up. I think I have an interpretation of why. Their remedies are very weak. They're exceedingly weak. The remedy for abusive dominance under the German variant of 102 is powerful, up to 10% of global turnover. Uh, one way of looking at this is that they're bringing the case because the data protection regime as it existed then would be weak. After the GDPR, it'll be the data protection agency that brings the case. Here's a bit of a, a, a trap you can come into, which is a form of regulatory leveraging. You use power in one regulatory scheme to leverage outcomes in another, where if you had to bring a standalone case in the other regime, it would be harder. Uh, when we did the mergers at the FTC, a couple of mergers that have figured prominently here, uh, DoubleClick one, but later AdMob. When we did AdMob, there was enormous pressure from the Bureau of Consumer Protection and the data team to put data specs into the second request, not for the purpose of challenging the matter itself, but to use the second request as a way to learn more about Google's data protection program. The Bureau of Competition fought that off. There was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And their point was, if it becomes clear that the Federal Trade Commission is leveraging the merger review process, where, by the way, you have to stand in line in a queue, and say, you can go through faster or slower depending upon whether or not you acquiesce to my requests here. If it becomes clear that you get a different result at the FTC than you do at DOJ, that will be the stimulus that gives us one federal competition agency in the US. And the survivor will not be the Federal Trade Commission. They backed off. But uh, the, 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 the interesting question when you look at this conjunction of privacy and competition law is not the question of whether privacy is a, a qualitative feature in the analysis. That's fine, that's traditional, that's standard. But where competition law becomes the mechanism where you have merger review in particular, where you're the gatekeeper, they have to wait, and you can ask for concessions while they're in line, or you can threaten them with a bigger fine, in what other areas would you apply this? Would you apply it, for example, where you have a dominant firm that's uh, extracting uh, illegal concessions from its employees about wages, about working conditions, would you say instead of going to the, to the, the relevant labor department, would you say we're going to settle that here? It's an abusive dominance to infringe the other, the other, the other Bill, laws. Bill, my understanding, I'm not a German lawyer, but I think this might be where 
German law is simply different in the sense that there are these German constitutional court decisions which essentially provide that conduct by a dominant company that might infringe some other law, for example, data protection law, and there are a couple cases that don't involve data protection law, but other illegal conduct, which I cannot now recall what it is, but that that, when it, that, that conduct, when engaged in by a dominant company, may be addressed by, it falls within the competence of the Bundeskartellamt. So, Indeed, and, and I, think, I think there's even a separate provision in the law that deals with dominant firms imposing oppressive terms uh, on individual parties as well. So there, there might be a legal, legal foundation there. I think the, the question's interesting in part because in the, in the 1970s, Mike Perchak, who was the chair of the FTC, sat in a, in a famous talk uh, dealing with uh, the meaning of Section 5 of the FTC Act, uh, said, why can't the Federal Trade Commission use its power over unfair methods of competition to police environmental policy standards? tax law, employment law. Why isn't a firm that gains a cost advantage by infringing another law engaged in an unfair method of competition? It doesn't comply with the other law. It saves money and it uses the savings to attack its rivals. Why don't we attack that directly? And the debate it inspired was, so the FTC is going to become the backstop for all public law without any specific limit on what law you can enforce. Uh, Mike's theory, I don't think, was silly, but the question was, how far does it stretch? Okay, uh, one, I'm going to have one final comment from Ariel on, on Facebook, and then we're going to open it up. To, just on Facebook, I want to share with you comments that Andreas Moon, the head of the Bundeskartellamt, made in Oxford last year. And, and I thought they were quite interesting, because what he said was that, although this is obviously a controversial intervention, he thought that from the company's perspective, they should appreciate that uh, if the alternative would have been an intervention of a regulator yeah. that would actually come in uh, with a more rigid uh, approach. And maybe we as a society would appreciate that. Um, and in that context, he mentioned that this investigation is not likely to result in a fine. Yeah, so, exactly. so because of the novelty here, this is an attempt in a way to correct what is seen to be uh, maybe a competition which is out of line with what is the norm, the expected norm. Um, but at least at the moment, it is not likely to result um, in a final decision. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I just want to do a quick show of hands, a, a quick poll, which is before uh, I ask for questions, which is um, we've had a, a, a discussion about differences. The, the broad uh, consensus is that obviously Europe is more, has more latitude from a legal point of view, has more incentive or more, is more willing to go into these cases and uh, has, has obviously done so. Um, and it, saying it's not useless, <laughs> entirely useless, doesn't seem to be answering the question which I want to answer, which is it really effective? Is it having a, uh, an impact on the conduct of companies? Now, it seems the strongest argument I've heard so far is that it has a big impact reputationally, that the more you're in the spotlight from an antitrust case, the more you respond to that in terms of your internal culture. But I just want to get a, a, a show of hands on two questions. One is a fairly straightforward one, which is, do we think, Europe, is in this regard Europe more interventionist. Um, so show of hands for, for yes. Uh, that's pretty unanimous. Okay. Is it more, is it more meaningfully more effective? Oh boy. It's sort of, so the, the, so the, the idea of the sort of European her heroic, uh, the only antitrust agency has gone missing in action, is, it, it doesn't seem to have a great deal of meaning. Okay, I want to open up uh, to, Can I just to, make to questions. Can yeah. I just what, yeah, go on. So yeah. I have a paper looking at the mobile industry around the world, okay? And I have a paper looking at the mobile industry around the world. And uh, it, there is regulation and then there is antitrust. On the regulation front, there are two countries that seem very similar to the United States, at the same score, that are Denmark and Germany. Now, these data are a couple of years old, so things might have changed. This is before uh, the merger from four to, to three in Germany. If you compare the prices in Germany and Denmark to the one in the United States, the price in the United States are enormously higher, okay? So we did a very back on the envelope calculation, not on the famous Harbinger triangle, but on the rectangle of transfer, okay? So the rectangle of transfer is how much uh, the basically industry, the, the, the phone, mobile phone industry in the United States, uh, appropriate from consumers, 
using Denmark and Germany as an example. So we're not looking at countries with uh, underdeveloped cell phones and stuff like that. And the answer is 50 billion a year. 50 billion a year. Now, if you think that this number is crazy, what we also have done is we'll look at the difference between market to book, thinking that uh, in the stock market, thinking that uh, the extra uh, profits should show up in extra market value. And uh, we see whether we can justify that difference based on this 50 billions. And if you assume a capitalization rate of 12%, you get exactly that number. So it's not completely out of the question that uh, the antitrust in Europe has been much more effective. And there are cases in which they fought very hard, including in Denmark, against the merger from four to three in the... In, in right, the but that's, that's in horizontal mergers. I mean, there's, yeah. there's plenty of evidence that says that, that there's, there's the John Crocker stuff and there's, mm. a, there's corresponding studies in Europe that says antitrust policy in mergers has been laxer in America than Europe. We're talk, we're, we are specifically addressing, Luigi, the, the, the issue of the, the, the actions against digital platforms and, and the effectiveness of those. Okay. So I think, I think it's fair to say that merger control has been more robust, less lax, whatever you, however you want to term it in, in America. And, and the telecoms industry might be a great example of that. Okay. But I just, uh, and we're really specifically on, on, the, on the antitrust, I'm, it's not clear okay. from what I've heard so far that, that we're really- <laughs> No, 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 I, I understand. That I thought that the question was more sure. general. Sure. No, 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 no. Could I make one, just one? No, I, I'm, gonna t I'm gonna take questions if, if okay. I may. Um, can I start with uh, Dennis Carlton uh, over here? I'm gonna take three if I can. And uh, someone, who, is there anyone who hasn't? No, third one over there, okay. Okay, um, first, I, I thought this was a, a great uh, panel. Um, <clears throat> I especially enjoyed Bill's comments that emphasized that the Chicago view is a bit of a stereotype. And uh, Harvard had a lot of smart scholars and still do who would agree with many people at Chicago. Um, um, and so perhaps some that would disagree. But I had two questions. Um, one has to do with, um, Ariel started it about exploitive. I always thought that was quite interesting that under EU law, law, if the price is too high, you can intervene. Um, in the United States, obviously, uh, one of the first things I teach my class is it's not illegal. It doesn't violate the antitrust laws to be a monopolist and charge a high price. So that's a different view about the process of competition. And in the United States, if you were a natural monopoly, we would regulate you. Uh, or perhaps in the past, we would regulate you. And the question um, um, that always struck me is that Europe has this natural pivot point built in that if you are a monopolist and become a monopolist, even by legitimate means, uh, maybe we'll step in and do something. And I always thought that was, was a two points about that. One, I thought that in Europe, even though you have this clause for exploitive and it allows you to intervene, it's been rarely used. And two, I thought it developed because in Europe, um, you had a lot of nationalized industries, unlike the United States. And therefore, it was a response to the fact that a lot of industries are concentrated because of um, a European uh, history. So, so I'd be interested in the answer to that. But then I, I had a second question. It really had to do with something uh, Gary was, was saying. I always enjoy listening to Gary. Um, um, about dominant firm and, um, and vertical behavior. In the United States, the view about justifying vertical behavior and vertical restrictions seems to be much different than in Europe. Certainly from the economic point of view, in terms of the application of economics, to, to lit litigation. When I was in the Department of Justice, the Legion case came down, and then I went over to Europe and I had a debate with the then chief economist there, and they were just astounded that um, anything like the Legion case would even be contemplated, um, as, uh, and that resale price maintenance uh, could, could ever be, be uh, legal. And um, my general view of vertical restrictions is that it would be very hard to justify certain vertical restrictions in Europe based on a rule of reason. Now in the United States we say we justify vertical restrictions because we have a balancing test. But people who have studied how often we balance, that is the pro-competitive features to the anti-competitive features, have found that judges don't like to do the balancing. And in very <coughs> rare cases, do you, they always come to the conclusion, oh, there are only benefits, no harms, or there are only harms, no benefits. 
and you never see balancing. In Europe, you never see, as far as, I'm, well, never is too strong, but I, I mean, this poses a question. My general impression is very rare to see balancing. Vertical restrictions, especially into the dis distribution sector, are uh, undesirable, viewed very unfavorably. And in part, it seems to me, that's because if you think about something like exclusive territories, which would allow different prices in different areas in Europe, that's frowned upon in Europe because the whole view of the European Union was to create relatively uniform pricing um, 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 and uh, to have a, 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 a union in which prices are, uh, tend to uniformity. And I'm just wondering, so on this vertical restriction, is Europe right in which they basically don't want to listen to economists about justifications for vertical restrictions? Or do you think the U.S. is right in which occasionally or uh, often there, uh, there's, a, there's a very great reluctance to intervene unless you see great harm from the vertical restrictions? Okay, on, on, that's two quite complex questions. I think we're going to have to take them and then uh, have the other questioners come in. On the vertical restraints, I think just even from my recollection, there was a European Court of Justice judgment quite recently that allows selective distribution. And the idea was um, you, can, you, can, you can insist if you're a supplier that you are not sold on, on, on Amazon. Um, That's the because it's going to commoditize your, I mean, I'm being really, this is not legal language, um, because it's going to commoditize your offering. So, so that actually Europe has sort of taken on, uh, you were referring to a, a judgment, I'm not sure if everyone knows it, uh, 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 basically about being allowed to sell a luxury good in the right environment so it doesn't go to a discount That's store, a uh, Supreme Court judgment about 10 years ago. Um, so should we, uh, is, <laughs> let's take the first question first and, and have the two people to my right talk about that. Um, and right. then we'll go to the vertical restraints, maybe with the people on yeah, my, on my sure. left, if that's okay. So I'll, I'll run fairly quickly uh, through this. Um, you're absolutely right when it comes to excessive pricing. Part of it is the idea of fairness, the idea of fair price. We have it specifically embedded into Article 102. So the idea that if you do not charge a fair price, and, and when we look into the origins, indeed, as you state, these are the differences in the market reality. Uh, a market that was not highly competitive, and this is given as an explanation of what, why we have it. It's true that the European Commission is reluctant to take those cases, but at the European member state level, you do see uh, quite a bit of, of cases. Some can be more controversial uh, than others when it comes to excessive, net, uh, excessive pricing. Um, uh, interesting story from one of the, of the agencies when they had um, a case that involved excessive pricing and exclusionary practice. When they were told that they cannot run the exclusionary uh, one, they decided to drop the case, uh, which gives you a bit of an indication that it exists, it does send a signal, but as you say, it is, it, it is somewhat controversial. But there is an, an understanding that high prices in themselves, whereas in the US you assume that they invite entry, it is not always as simple as that. The CMA, by the way, says we will intervene if we identify a market failure. It's not that we will just go in, we will go if there is a market failure. And on the vertical, I, I slightly, uh, slightly disagree uh, because it is true that under Article 4 of the vertical block exemption, you have the hardcore restrictions and there there is no discussion. One of them is RPM. But outside that, there is a vivid discussion and Coty is an excellent example of, of balances um, that are quite difficult because balances would take into account the relationship between uh, brick and mortar, uh, online. Uh, so quite a, quite a bit of a, of a discussion of whether something should be regarded as hardcore or should be regarded as an effect-based analysis. So, but, but obviously there is this idea of a union that makes verticals a bit more suspicious to, in many instances. Yes, did you want to add a comment to that? Uh, briefly about the exploitative abuse. I th the, the clauses about uh, preventing exploitative abuse have been, at least in Germany, in the law well before there was any common market. Uh, so the, and I think they have been exported from Germany's competition law into the European yeah. law. And so the motivation to sort of equalize prices among, uh, across Europe, I think, is only partly uh, or to some degree explaining it. I rather agree with, uh, with Ariel. It's, it, it's really about fairness or with, about distribution of rents. Uh, there's other clauses also in Germany's competition law that are clearly only addressing distribution issues. So it's not all about, uh, it's a, about competition. It is also about distribution of rents. Fact that, that is the reality. And if you look at the 
cases, apart from the Facebook case, the most cases, most cases have been taken in industries where we don't have any common market, namely water industry, where for reasons of political economy there is no proper regulation, uh, and the gas industry uh, recently. Uh, so gas retailing at the regional uh, uh, level, really. So and this is, makes it even more clear that it is about distribution because these are typically goods where many consumers care about because everybody's consuming it. Uh, so it's, it is a substitute for, for regulation because for a variety of reasons there's no proper regulation. So it's, it's, a, it's a safe safety measure to some degree where you don't have regulation. Uh, can I ask, uh, Bill, can you take the, the question about resale, well, a vertical restraints and resale price making and all the, of that? The consistency that Mario described this mo morning was a bit of an illusion. That is, when you look at the member states on resale price maintenance, you see disagreement with yeah. the commission. Yeah. And to the commission's considerable irritation, you have individual member states, which under the guise of prioritization, are not bringing these cases and are saying so in a public way. So if we were to assemble the, the member state uh, directors general of these authorities and heads and said, are you bringing the resale price maintenance cases as object offenses with no justifications, there'd be a significant number that would say no. Uh, so uh, the ferment and the debate uh, is very intense in a number of settings about what the right approach should be. And the, the mechanism for, for, for equilibration is to say, it's not a priority. We're not bringing those cases. But it's a real debate. Not in Brussels, but in the member but states. Actually, there is a division of opinion within the European Commission. There are some in the Commission who would take the Dutch position, which is, we're yeah. not going to enforce yeah. it, and yeah. others who are traditionalists. Yeah. Is, there, is there any sense in which the, the, the court judgment I referred to is, is actually a, a convergence of an, a European standard towards an American standard? Is that, am I reading too much into it? Well, I'd leave that one to Bill. I'm not so yeah. sure. Uh, it's, it's, it's a possibility, uh, but, but a lot of it depends on how much you believe in the real uh, opportunities for rebuttal, what kind of justifications work. Mm -hmm. I would say the mm -hmm. traditionalist view that Thomas referred to within the commission is in theory the justifications exist, in practice they're threadbare. Uh, so that uh, and one, one traditionalist who tends to lead the policy discussion says, goes through all of the justifications, says, I know of a less restrictive way, I know of a less restrictive way, and casts them aside. Uh, I suspect decisions like this keep the door open a bit uh, for a continuing rethink on this. But that's going to require a change in the, in the terms of the intellectual debate and discussion uh, uh, over time. So in principle, yes, the rebuttal possibilities are there. In, in practice, they tend to be narrow, but the dis this decision helps. Thanks. Uh, it might be pointed out, by the way, that the member states of the United States also disagree on retail price maintenance with the federal, <laughs> <laughs> with the federal government, uh, and no one really knows what, how that works out. Uh, so I've really enjoyed this uh, panel and, and this entire uh, uh, conference. And um, one of the things I li I've liked about this panel, and I think it should be a, a model or something that happens more in discussions in the United States and Europe, is um, a discussion not just of the differences um, with respect to the substantive law, which I, I don't deny are important or, and are easier to see, but a discussion of the differences in remedy and remedy culture, because uh, uh, I think that is a really important, and this gets, this is uh, getting at your question um, of the moderators, you know, are they effective? But is there a different, and that's sort of my big question, is there fundamentally a different uh, remedy uh, culture? Uh, and that's something I, I'd like to know about. Let me also, um, I want to mention a few things that have been mentioned. Uh, the UK Market Investigations, uh, uh, I don't even know what it's called, and their breakup of the, uh, of the airports uh, in, the, in the United uh, Kingdom may, may give more suggestion that, that Europe is more interested in, or at least parts of Europe are more interested in structural remedies than sometimes they get uh, credit for. And I know some people have said that's been successful. Uh, but the comment I want to make before, before people answer that question is, I think also just more generally I feel like what we need uh, more research on, and maybe I'm calling an economist, maybe everyone, uh, is uh, retro. You know, we, we've had a lot of retroactive studies of um, of, of mergers. You know, can we, do we can we have more retroactive studies of of, of remedies? You, you know, Gar Gary has a set of very important uh, examples that I think are, are very um, strong. Uh, 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 for example, the AT and T uh, breakup resulting in this massive. You know, revitalization of what had been sort of a very stagnant sector. Um, 
And if that's right, and if it's also right that Microsoft, um, uh, the managed Microsoft case and the trial being the remedy, uh, you know, gave room for, for the web companies to get started. You know, if that's right, the value of those interventions are not like millions of billions, but trillions of dollars, right? And it'd be interesting, to, you know, but that's sort of hard to falsify. I know these things are hard to do. That seems to me, if, if th those are right, that those are the sort of most, one of the most important areas that we should all be trying to figure out. And also as enforcement, for those of us working in enforcement, trying to figure out when that's likely to be the case. You know, when something like a big breakup or a trial is likely to yield, you know, that kind of dynamic uh, benefit. Anyway, that strikes me as like some of the most important thing to be thinking about. And maybe people are doing a lot of that research already, but I, I wanted to put it out. Anyway, my, my question was, do Europe and the <laughs> United States fundamentally have a different enforcement culture? Uh, a remedy, remedy culture. culture. That's the question. So, who, anyone want to take that up? It's going to be you, Bill. Uh, <laughs> You're in the chat. You know, Tim mentioned an interesting example: the markets regime in the United Kingdom, uh, which allows the Competition and Markets Authority to do a study and then impose remedies without regard to any violation of an existing competition law command. An interesting question for the United States. They've used it two times in now uh, 17 years. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's occasionally used, but the airports case was a good example where they uh, spun off, uh, divested the ownership from the British Airports Authority of, of, uh, of the, uh, the main uh, London and then Scotland airports. An important, uh, an important uh, feature of that is that it is deliberately detached from the existing unilateral conduct mechanism. Question for the United States, if you want to unstick US Section 2 doctrine and give a tool to the public agencies alone without the heavy baggage that comes with private rights, should you adopt something like this, which essentially means either going into Section 5 and making it work, which it has done very unsuccessfully for 103 years, but you try again, uh, and you, you have a remedial scheme, or do you change the statute to do it? Statutes are hard to change. But if I was going to study one thing to come back on the U.S. mechanism, and I'm touting uh, the system that I observed there, I like the markets regime because it allows you to look at a wide array of circumstances and ask, why did this come about? How did it happen? And to impose remedies directly without distorting the boundaries of competition law. It's a mandate to do this subject to judicial review. And, and just a word on ex post review, uh, I think they're uh, compared, to, compared to 20 years ago, we're much better off in doing this. There are more and more people who are doing work on this. It's difficult to do in some ways you don't know until the years after, until you get the company archives that tell you what they were really thinking. Uh, uh, IBM, for example, falls into Gary's example of a company that, even though the case itself generated a dismissal, Thomas Watson Jr.'s uh, autobiography says the fact that the case was there caused us to change our behavior in a notable way. So uh, I'd, say, I'd say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people would have said ex post review. It's a nice to have. Today, I think more and more people are saying it's a must have. Can well, I, just I uh, wanted to. Can oh, I, go, please. Can please, I just. Yeah. Uh, Tim, in order to ask the question fairly about European remedy, I think you'd have to, you'd have, to have a caveat, which is. Do you really think the European Commission is going to take apart an American company? Okay, that's the question you would start with. Then you'd have the subset. Do you really think they're going to take apart an American company when the President of the United States is criticizing them on national, international television? Do you really think they're going to take apart an American company when you know, the international trade representative is? So there, there's one. I think there's one question about what Europe would do left to its own devices in a neutral situation. And there's quite another question. I mean, as you know, in, in the shopping case, we went in hard in the Almunia administration saying the only way you're going to be able to fix this is to have them either shut down or spin off shopping. But, you know, we were just as effective as every other argument in the Almunia administration. We've got time for just probably one more question. And Carl had his hand up first, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's been a clear sort of consensus the Europeans have a stronger regime here. I want to ask about buyer power as opposed to seller power. When we revised the merger guidelines in 2010, we added a section about mergers that create buyer power, an example being to chicken processors, and they merge, and the chicken farmers have nobody else to sell to, so they get squeezed. And the, um, 
the folks over in the DG Comp said, this is terrible. We are only concerned about the consumers. What are you worrying yourself upstream? It's a very dangerous, it's going to be confusing or bad. So is there a concern about buyer power, now maybe labor markets as well, one learner is talking about? Is, is that the case where we have the opposite, where the U.S. is more concerned than EU, or is it, or not? You said you want to say that? Uh, I, I, at the European level, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not as sure as at the national level. Uh, I know that in, in Germany there have been a number of merger cases where buyer power was a decisive argument, uh, actually, for uh, prohibiting these type of merger. The uh, highly debated supermarket merger that we had two years ago was also one aspect was the strengthening of buyer power, actually, even though. Um, Actually, it may have benefit uh, consumers. I mean, there's always this trade-off, right, between buyer power. But uh, as, as I mentioned before, since there are these distributional aspects in the law, buyer power plays an important role, uh, actually, in, in, in merger cases. Uh, in dominance cases, I'm not so aware, uh, actually, even though now we sort of in the, in the retail grocery market, we are substituting the, the uh, Commissioner Hogan, so not the Competition Commission, has basically come up with a set of proposals how to structure uh, bargaining uh, between retailers and manufacturing in the, uh, in the food sector, uh, which substitutes somehow competition law uh, by giving them some set of, sort of set of guidelines or regulations how to, what, what, how to bargain and how not to bargain, uh, actually. And this is, um, well, actually, there have, has also been an abuse of dominance case uh, with respect to buyer power. Uh, when one of the German uh, the supermarkets was asking for special rebates following a merger, uh, basically asking the manufacturers to sort of give them the conditions of the, the better conditions of the two firms. Uh, so, and this has been um, now decided as being abusive behavior. Uh, okay, Thomas, so, you want to just take that question? I don't sleep. think things have changed dramatically since the days you've had that discussion. There are some member states that <coughs> will pursue monopsony issues. Norway, for example. It's not a member state, but it's part of the EEA. So I, I think it's basically some member states will pursue it. I don't think you get very much traction with the European Commission. There is uh, still West East osmosis going on. The no poaching cases in the U.S. are drawing attention to that. In some way, those will be emulated, I'd predict, over the next three or four years. You'd see it taken up more, yes. Okay, we have a, a minute left, so I'm going to ask everyone to speak for whatever, 12 seconds, uh, uh, to just say which one thing would you, that you see in, on either side of the Atlantic do you think the other side of the Atlantic should adopt with regard to the practice of antitrust enforcement in this regard? So it has to be very brief. I'm going to go from left to right. Thomas. I think authorities on both sides of the Atlantic should pursue issues concerning terms of use by platform companies with their users that enable those companies, those platform companies, to combine sources of data in ways that enable them to erect barriers to entry, um, preventing other online advertising intermediaries to compete effectively. Okay. Gary? Um, I think that the European Union was very effective against Microsoft because they fined the company substantially and continued to find them, and the threat was fines for infinity. They have not delivered that threat credibly in the Google situation, which is the reason they're not effective. If they did more of that, instead of looking here, look to their own history, I think they'd be more effective. Okay. Bill? Uh, a Mario Monti theme, a genuine effort by agreement, not by merger of the Department of Justice and FTC to map out what the future direction of Section 2 should be to reconsider unilateral conduct theories and use the complementary strengths that both they have to breathe life back into Section 2 of the Sherman Act. <coughs> okay. yes, yes. Uh, I would like to see the European Commission <coughs> taking a more lenient approach to um, uh, vertical restraints, uh, actually, especially when they are sort of relating to non-dominant firms. Okay, so one, one lesson from America. <laughs> Ariel, finally. I, I would say for both sides, maybe to have a better understanding of the dynamics of the new markets that we have. I think that we're, we're all lacking there. So the dynamics of competition, <coughs> understanding where market power actually emerges, and realizing to some extent that market power in the new economy may emerge below the thresholds that we're familiar with. 
Thank you so much. Uh, could you, before we hand over to Luigi, can you just join me in, in thanking the, uh, the panel for a very stimulating <laughs> discussion? <laughs> Thank you. <coughs>